So let's talk about views of probability. There are actually several. It might seem like this is something you don't get to have a view, right? You're like, I don't get to get his perspective. Probability is just probability. Um, I wish it were that simple. It's really not that simple, but it doesn't have to be too hard. We can understand how some of these come across. We're going to deal with at least two and focus on one in our class. The third is a very powerful force in modernity, especially with computing abilities. Um, it would came, Someone came up with it, Thomas Bayes, way back when, but it was computationally too intensive to do. Uh, and now his math, as we rediscovered it in the age of computers, we've realized how useful his view on probability really was. So let's talk about some of the views of probability. Really, I think we can boil this down to three major views. There's what's called the classical or analytic view on probability, associated with guys like Cardano, um, an Italian polymath. Uh, you have the empirical or frequentist view, uh, associated with guys like Fisher and Gauss. And then you have the subjective or Bayesian view, which uh, named after Thomas Bayes. Most often you'll hear that called Bayesian statistics or Bayesian probability. Um, so these guys, believe it or not, kind of have slightly different takes on how we should look at probability in the world. So the classic view from Cardano was this idea that you were probably taught growing up. That like, I simply say, well, here's my sample space and here's the ways the event can occur. So I just take the event possibility, the probability, the, you know, the ways the event can occur, divide it by the total sample space. That's the probability of the event. That works only when you have a knowable, definable sample space. So it's simple, it's easy, it's great to teach for third grade mathematics, but it doesn't work in the real world for most inferential needs. The empirical or frequentist view was then a means of supplanting this that allowed us to realize that in a lot of time, a lot of cases, we do not have a knowable, definable sample space. So how is it that you get at the probability of something happening if you don't even know everything that could happen right? And you don't know for certain how probable the given thing is via some count, right? So we'll take a look at some examples to clarify that. The last one, I put a little joke here. We're not going to deal with this in too much depth. I will give you a little introduction to Bayes because it is becoming so popular. Um, and it really is a very useful way to think about probability. And I'll show you why in a second. Um, so I joke here about the idea that it's, I think, therefore I am, because it's called subjective sometimes. But it's not subjective in that you just get to guess. That's a joke, right? Rather, Bayes accounted for the fact that we should take into account priors in our experience to estimate posteriors for probability. So we shouldn't just say this is the probability. Rather, um, I have a set of priors, that is the experiences I've had, that I bring in and use to inform my estimation of some posterior probability of a thing happening, right? And then I always continually, in a, in a cyclic way, gain new information and update my posterior. So my, my prior, here's my baseline assumption, right? I then add some data, right? I use my input, which is my assumption, my prior knowledge, plus my data. And the combination of them leads to some posterior probability, right? Prior meaning before, posterior meaning after. Now that posterior serves now in a, in a cyclic fashion, right, as my new prior. So I have this new probability I estimated from my baseline assumptions, my priors, and baseline data. I get a new probability of posterior, but then I'm going to go through that same process again because there's always new data. All life is data, right? We take for granted statistics everywhere. Your entire life, your brain is making inferences. When you think you know things, your brain has to go through all kinds of hoops to make assumptions about things. And it's doing statistics even if you don't realize it. Kind of like the video that I shared, um, the TED Talk from Laura Schultz earlier in the class. So let's talk about these views and kind of when they work and when they break down and what they offer. So the classic view of probability works really well when you're a third grader and your teacher says, I have five apples, one of them is red. What is the probability that I get a red apple? And the answer there would be 0.2, right? One divided by five is 0.2 or 20% if we make it a percentage, right? So one in five as a fraction, 0.2 as a proportion, 20% as a percentage. So that's easy because I have a very noble, definable sample space. There's five items, right? I also can count, i.e. get the event probability. There's one red. And so then it's a simple division process. So that's really great. But what happens when you don't get your teacher to tell you like there's five apples, <laughs> right? What happens when you're actually in the world? In the world, you have no idea. You have no freaking clue. The fact of the matter is you're human. You're in 
you're inherently in, you're inherently finite, right? You're inherently limited by your own abilities mentally, by your own experiences spatially and temporally. We have, by definition, an inability to access the completeness of sample spaces. So what we do is we have a limited experience that is our own. In the small amount of time we live on this planet, the small amount of experiences we have in that time, we can use that information to try to collect data, and we do, and we use that to try to make guesses about how the world works. But they're guesses based on our very limited experiences and our very finite abilities. You're not going to find anyone who thinks humans are literally have the potential to be you know, omniscient, and infinite. I've never met anyone who thinks that's going to be a potential, right? And so if you realize that these are inherent limits, we realize that this approach to probability is going to break down if we are honest about our own limits. It's not just about statistics. It's just about being human. It's about the nature of life and the limits of your you're thrown into a world where you don't have any information and a bunch of people give you some, hey, oh, this is what we think about the world. And then you collect some data your whole life, i.e. you live and have experience. And you use that to continually update what you think about the world. It Hopefully, right? If you don't ever update your beliefs about the world, then you're obviously not using data. Uh, so we have to go through this process of like dealing with the fact that we're limited. We don't get to know, you know, these numbers that we need. We don't know the sample space, right? We can't just easily tabulate the probabilities, right? If we want to get at some kind of truth in that, we've got to do something more. So I think a great example that gets at this is the idea of Mary Poppins and her magical bag, right? I think this really helps to illustrate how the world actually is. The world is this giant bag that contains an infinite number of things that you just don't know. And you reach in and you grab things and you don't know why that's the thing you grabbed. And, and this, I think, is akin to our experience. You know, Life is in a giant bag of infinite possibilities, and we reach in in our own lifetimes and grab out certain things. We have certain experiences, right? We observe certain things. We use that data and information to make decisions. But we have no idea what could be grabbed next because there's this apparent infinite potential of things that could come out, right? Like this lamp should not be able to come out of her bag, which tells us there's something about this bag that makes the sample space of things contained in the bag unknowable and undefinable. Mary Poppins can just pull anything out of her bag, right? So if we can't know the sample space in Mary Poppins' bag, how can we figure out what the probability is that she would pull a lamp out of it, right? You see the problem here? Like, she's pulling out a lamp. What are the chances she'd pull out a lamp? Well, in the classic view, you would have to know everything that could be contained in her bag, the entire sample space. But with her bag, it's obvious that you can't. So given this, how is it that we get at some concept of the probability of getting a lamp or some other object from her bag? And the answer is experience. The answer is empiricism. Empiricism is about collecting data through observation. And so empiricist or empirical views of probability that use the frequentist approach simply say, if we need to get at the probability of some event right happening, we just need to keep sampling. So the more things you pull out of Mary Poppins' bag, the better picture you get of what things could come out of Mary Poppins' bag. So if you pull you know, a million things out of her bag and get 72 lamps, then you now have some estimate. Okay, I, I counted the frequency of X, uh, that is of, of pulling out a lamp. We're using X for that, right? The, the frequency of that was 72. The sample size, that is how many things I took from her bag, is a million. There's 72 in 1 million right? Chances of me pulling a lamp out of her bag. That's the probability. And notice that's a frequentist perspective. It, it uses empirical process. It's not saying, oh, well, I just, I know what's there. I have the answer of the sample space. And this is what modern day statistics principally hinges on because we deal with things that by definition have unknowable, undefinable sample spaces in many cases, whether that's because of inherent limits at a philosophical level or practical limits in our ability to measure all these things, right? Those limits are there. They, they are unavoidable. It's not a problem with statistics. It's just a problem with being human. It's a problem with like, we're trying to make big decisions out of small amounts of information that we can get in our lives, right? And so the frequentist provides a solution, simply take samples and use those samples to estimate probabilities. Now, of course, this hits on important mathematical laws like the law of large numbers. 
an, empir an empirical probability as my sample size n approaches infinity, i.e. sampling all things that could be sampled, the observed probability will approach the theoretical probability. That is the truth, the true probability. The theoretical probability is the truth, right? It's the actual probability. So you can think about it like imagine I had a bag of a million starbursts and you wanted to know what's the probability of getting a pink one out of this, right? Well, you could be like there's four options, but we all know that they do not put equal numbers, right? They, they short us on the pink. We all know this because pink is the best, right? So they don't give us enough pink. So if we want to know, well, what's the probability, right? It's not like we have literally just four starbursts and we can go, well, I have one in four or 0.25 or 25% chance of pink. Now that doesn't work because they don't exist in these like perfect one in four chances. So how do I figure out the probability of getting a pink one from this enormous bag that like, I'm not going to count the whole thing, right? So in this case, notice it is knowable and definable, but it's impractical to decide to do that, right? To count the entire bag. So what do you do? You take samples, right? If I take a sample of random, this is important, random sampling. Random sampling is the idea that every object, right? Every unit of analysis has an equal and constant chance of being selected. In a case like this, to ensure that that happens, I must sample with replacement, key term here, sample with replacement. What this means is if I pull out a starburst, I have to put it back, shake everything back up and pull out another one. If I just keep pulling them out, then I can be affecting the probability. So sampling with replacement is an important thing in random sampling in these kinds of contexts. Now there are all kinds of random samples. We're just dealing with what's called a simple random sample here. So if I have this bag of Starburst, I pull things out, put them back in, shake it up, pull another one out. If I were to sample 100 Starburst, right, and I say get 17, per 17 pink out of 100. So now my estimate is that the proportion of pink Starburst is 0.17, right, 17%. Okay, so the rule here is that as I increase my sample size n, I actually am going to approach the theoretical probability. And this becomes pretty obvious that if you were to sample the entire 1 million starburst, you would have literally obtained the theoretical, the true probability, as long as you counted correctly, right? Now, this is important though to realize that because of something like sampling error, which we learned about before, that is that there are inherent discrepancies between the estimate you get from a sample and the true value in the population that's due to the process of sampling. It's not a boo-boo, it's not a mistake, it's just what happens, right? So if I take 100 starbursts and I get an estimate of 0.17, and then I take 200 starbursts and get an estimate of 0.2, 0.2 is probably a better estimate, but I can only say it is probably a better estimate. I cannot definitively say that because of sampling error, right? And so this is where the sample size we take is important to computing a margin of error on an estimate. So this is relevant in all kinds of modern day contexts, like when people talk about um, who's going to vote for whom in a presidential election. That has to take a sample. We can't ask every voting American, right? So we take samples. How we take those samples is critically important, number one. And number two, the size of the sample matters in terms of shrinking the margin of error, right? So that's not to say that a sample of 5,000 is inherently better than a sample of 1,000, right? That's especially not true if we have not randomly sampled both, right? We talked about the importance of random sampling in lecture one. If you don't remember, go back and look at sampling from our introductory material. But assuming both samples are randomly taken, then it is reasonable to assume that the sample that is 5,000 provides a better estimate of the true probability than the sample from 1,000, okay? That's reasonable and probabilistically true, but it is not definitely true because of sampling error. So these things are important to realize, and hopefully that helps you get some sense of these different views of probability. Again, we'll focus primarily on the empirical here, but I will come back one more time in this probability section, and we'll talk about Bayes and how it is relevant, particularly relevant right now in the context of diagnostics.